A great light dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say wonder working rebel priest. Jesus Christ the Nazarene. He knew well what it would take to free us all from sin and grief. A perfect man would have to die, and only he could pay that price. Friday's good cause Sunday is coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming Devil you're done you better start running Friday's good cause Sunday is coming a bride for a groom no church arise he's coming soon oh jesus is alive he's coming soon come on and stand up everybody it's time to celebrate this morning let's praise him how pleasing the valley 
time right now, Lord, to invite your presence. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection, Lord. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven, spoke your name into the night. And then through the darkness, your loving kindness, it tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, you're my living Lord. See, our Jesus, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. To wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross that's broken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his 
Thank you, Jesus. Tell them out loud. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy are you to receive the honor, the glory, the power forever. And we join with heaven this morning in singing that. Worthy are you, Jesus. Thank you for your resurrection, God, to prove that you are God. Thank you for bringing us to new life with you. So we celebrate this morning. And God, right now, we just ask you to speak to us from your word. Speak to us, God. Get our hearts and our minds ready to hear. And Holy Spirit, work in our midst. We lay everything we come in here carrying this morning before your feet, Lord. We surrender to you completely. Now speak to us, God. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus is alive. Come on, praise him one more time. Love you, Lord. Woo. Well, you can all have a seat. I want to welcome you to Otterbein Church. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us on this Easter Sunday morning. Those of you watching us from home, wherever you're watching from, we are so glad that you've chosen to join us as well. You know, here in the worship center, uh, I just encourage you to take a few minutes when you go home today to look over the announcements in the bulletin, or you can go to OC Connect uh, on our app or on our website. Those of you watching online, that's where you can go to OC Connect on our, our app on our web, uh, website. And, and, and there you will find 
find uh, information about things that are coming up here in the life of our church. It's coming Tuesday. We have a first Tuesday prayer gathering, but there's a lot of other things in there. So make sure you check that out here after the service today. Well, I want to take you back to that first Easter morning. In fact, really, I want to go back to the Sunday before that. We call it Palm Sunday. It was the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And as he entered into Jerusalem, you know, he's riding on the back of a a donkey's colt. And people were waving their their palm branches and and, uh, shouting their hosannas to him. They, they, They were welcoming Jesus as king as he entered into Jerusalem. What is interesting as you read the Bible is that even later on that day, there were people that started to back away from that. And as the week progressed, more and more people said, ah, I don't think Jesus probably is the king. They're not the kind of king we were looking for anyway. And uh, we know that there were people that started deserting him as the week progressed. Thursday comes. And Jesus, he gathers his disciples together and they share a meal, the Passover meal. When that's done, they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's while they're there praying and after they pray that Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and Jesus is arrested. Friday morning comes. Jesus stands on trial and uh, he's convicted of crimes he didn't commit. And he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. He had to carry his cross and uh, they nailed him to that cross. And they crucified him on that cross. And by three o'clock on Friday afternoon, Jesus breathed his last breath and he died. And they took his body down and they placed his body in a tomb and they rolled a big stone in front of it. And when all of that happened, many people who had followed Jesus, they couldn't quite understand what they had just observed and watched happen. And Jesus' enemies, they thought they had finally won. And certainly the devil believed that he had finally been victorious over Jesus. Saturday comes and goes. And then the sun rises on what we call Easter Sunday. And here's how the Bible describes what took place on that day. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes and the women were terrified and they bowed with their faces to the ground. And the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Do you remember what he told you back in Galilee that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day? And then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and he ran to the tomb to look. And stooping, he peered in and he saw the empty linen wrappings. And then he went home again, wondering what had happened. You know, the thing that strikes me about all of the accounts of Jesus' resurrection in the Bible is that his followers, those closest to him, those who had heard him say that he was going to die and rise from the dead on the third day, they were really struggling to make sense of what was going on here. They couldn't wrap their head around this idea that they had just seen Jesus die on a cross. They knew that his body was placed in the tomb and somehow Jesus wasn't there and that he was alive. They couldn't quite believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. But as the day progresses, Jesus starts appearing to people. He appears to Peter. He appears to a number of the women. And we know from the Bible that over the next 40 days, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. 500 people saw the resurrected Christ with their very own eyes. And when they did, they did believe. And their lives were never the same. There is something about the resurrection of Jesus that is life-changing. 
Not only for those that saw the risen Christ with their very own eyes, but for all of us, for you and me, when we choose to believe and fully grasp the significance of the resurrection. Here's what I'd like to do for a few minutes with you this morning. I want to remind you of four things about the resurrection that are true and life-changing if you will choose to believe them. Here's the first thing. One of the things that Jesus' resurrection proved was that he is more powerful than anyone or anything. Jesus' resurrection proved that he was more powerful than anyone or anything. We human beings have a, a, a lot of ability to do a lot of pretty amazing things. And, and there are many people in the world who are powerful and influential, but here's what is true. No one has the ability to defeat death and has the power to raise the dead like Jesus. You might say, but Mike, there are doctors today and we have you know, uh, medical devices that when someone dies that they can be brought back to life and they can use defibrillators. And, and I grant you all of that. But there has never been anyone who has had the ability to raise someone from the dead who had been dead for four days, nor has there ever been anyone to raise themselves from the dead. Only Jesus Christ did that. And when Jesus Christ came, overcame death, he proved that he was more powerful than anything and greater than anyone. I don't know what you might be facing in your life today, but I have a pretty good guess that probably most of you in this room and watching online right now, that you'd say, you know what, I got some fairly big challenges I'm trying to overcome in my life right now. Things that I'm dealing with that are causing me stress and anxiety and I'm worried about them. Uh, maybe for you, it's that you have a disease or cancer or that you're sick. Maybe for you, it is something that's going on with your kids or your grandkids and you look at it and your heart is grieved and you know that the choices they're making aren't great choices and that you've been trying to help them and work with them and, and that you don't seem to be making a lot of progress and it's just stressing you out. Maybe for you, it's a broken relationship that you have with someone or an addictive behavior that you have prayed, you have pleaded with God, you have tried to do all kinds of things to overcome, but it still seems to have a hold on you. Or maybe it's fear or worry or anxiety or an anger that controls your life. Or maybe for you, it's just feelings of despair. Maybe even so much so that you're not even really sure if life is worth living. The truth is, life can be hard and life can be full of challenges and sometimes it's easy to lose hope. But here's the good news this day, that there is someone and his name is Jesus who is bigger and more powerful than your greatest challenge. And Jesus wants to help you face whatever that challenge is. And he wants to help you to walk through and work on that challenge in your life. Now you might be thinking, Mike, how do you know that Jesus wants to do that for me? How do you know that he wants to help me? How do you really know that he's bigger and greater than the thing that I'm dealing with in my life? I'll tell you how we know. We know it because Jesus showed us through his death and resurrection that he is greater than anything and that he is greater and more powerful than anyone. I want you to think about this with me. So why did Jesus come to this earth to begin with? Why did he come to this earth to begin with? He came because we had something that we could not overcome. We had a sin problem. And that sin problem robbed us from a good life. That sin problem has all kinds of consequences associated with it. That sin problem would keep us out of going to heaven one day. That sin problem is the thing that got in the way of us being able to have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. Jesus knew all of that. And so Jesus, he comes into this world for you. And for me to help us deal with this problem that is too big for us to handle ourselves. And he came into this world out of love for us. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead, what Jesus Christ did was he provided a way for us to be forgiven of our sins, to take care of the sin problem and to give us the ability to have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. The truth is that this Jesus, 
There is no one that could have done what Jesus did for us. There is nothing else that could have done what Jesus did for us. Only Jesus Christ did what he did for us. And if Jesus Christ would go as far as dying on a cross to help us with a problem we couldn't overcome, what makes us think that he would not help you and me overcome what we're dealing with in our life today? Now, please don't misunderstand. I don't want to suggest to anybody here today that if you just follow Jesus and believe in Jesus, that you'll never have any problems in life. Because Jesus doesn't promise that. He doesn't promise us that we'll be healed from every disease. He doesn't promise us that we'll never have to deal with temptation. He doesn't promise us that we won't at times struggle emotionally. He doesn't promise us that we will have an easy life. He doesn't promise those things. But here's what he does promise. He promises us that he will give us everything we need in the midst of those challenges. He will walk with us and there will be times that he will help us to overcome. In John chapter 16 of the Bible, we read this verse. It says, here on this earth, and Jesus is saying this, here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. One of the things we know to be true because Jesus died and rose from the dead is that there is nothing more powerful or greater than he is. And he wants to help us and walk with us through whatever we have to face in life if we will choose to follow him and believe in him. Let me tell you a second thing that Jesus' resurrection proved. It proved that you can and should believe everything that Jesus taught and everything that Jesus promised. I want to talk about this with you for a minute. We're living at a time when more and more people just outright discount anything in the Bible, anything that Jesus said. And even among some Christian people today who say they believe in the Bible, more and more people are picking and choosing what parts of the Bible they want to agree with and accept as true, and then they kind of discount the other parts. People today are becoming very selective in what parts of the Bible and even in what things that Jesus said, what they want to believe about those things. But friends, here's one of the things the death and resurrection of Jesus convinces me of. And that is that you and I can have confidence that everything that Jesus taught and promised, even if it doesn't make sense to us, can be believed and should be believed. I want to take you back to Jesus' death and resurrection for a minute. So what we know is that in the days leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection, he had been telling his followers, his disciples, he had been telling them, you know, there's going to be a day when I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise from the dead. He's, he'd been telling them. In fact, look at one of the times he did this. It's in Mark chapter 10 in the Bible. It says, listen, Jesus is talking here. Listen. We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and teachers of religious law. And they will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Now think about that. Jesus said those words before any of this happened. And as we've already suggested today and talked about for a little bit today, all of those things happened just like that. All of that happened. And here's what I would submit to you. When anyone can predict their death and their resurrection and tell you how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and then it happens just like he said, you really should pay attention to everything else that he said, and you really should choose to believe everything else he said. You can take Jesus at his word, and you should. When Jesus says something, for example, is a sin, it's a sin. We don't get to pick and choose whether, well, I'm not sure Jesus is right about that. You could always take him at his word and you should. When Jesus says that you are forgiven if you confess sins to him, 
then you are forgiven. And I know sometimes we think, well, what I've done is just too awful, too big. Jesus would never forgive me. I am unforgivable. That is just not true. Jesus is not a liar. And he says that if you will confess your sins to him, that he will forgive your sins, period, every time. Some of you today, you feel unlovely and you feel unlovable. And maybe you've even had people say things like that to you. And you know your past, you know what you've done. And this idea that somehow God loves you, that Jesus loves you, you know, that just seems so foreign to you because as you think about your life, how could anyone love you because of what you've done and because of who you are? And I just want to say to you today, Jesus is not a liar. And he loves you unconditionally. That is his promise. That is what he said. And you can always take him at his word. One of the things that resurrection proved is that when Jesus says something, you can and should choose to believe it. I want to say one more thing about this before we go on. Today, I think that one of the hangups that a lot of people have with the Bible is that they think it is too restrictive. It's almost like the teachings of the Bible. Like if I follow those teachings in my life, I'm just going to be missing out on some really good stuff and it's just not going to be good. Now, please understand something about the scriptures and the things that Jesus said that are recorded in those scriptures. The scriptures were given to us for our good. The God of the universe, he created us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows how to experience the best life possible on this earth. He knows more about us than we would ever begin to think we would know about ourselves. And because of that, God wanted to give us a plan, a way to say, if you want to experience life at its best, here is the best way. If you want to live outside of that, there are consequences and problems. What we have is the Bible given to us for our good, not to keep us from good. It's for our good. And that's why you can and should pay attention to what it teaches and commit yourself to follow its teachings And the reason you know that it can be trusted is because the one who rose from the dead, he's the one that gave it to us. And you can always take him at his word. Here's the third thing that I want you to consider with me today. And that is that Jesus' resurrection helps us to not be afraid of death and to have confidence that we will spend our eternal life in heaven. Earlier, I mentioned that, you know, Jesus had raised someone from the dead after four days. And I want us to look at the scripture in John chapter 11 where it talks about this. Before I do, let me just kind of tell you what's going on here with this. So Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he had developed some very close friendships with some people. Uh, One of those were uh, two women by the name of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And Jesus had hung out with them some, and it was clear that they had a very unique and special relationship, uh, Jesus and the three of them. Well, Jesus is out one day teaching with his disciples, and Lazarus gets sick. And the sisters send word to Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. I have no doubt that in their mind, they're thinking, I know Jesus has healed people and Jesus can heal Lazarus. He really needs healed here. And so they thought, they expected that Jesus would drop what he was doing and he would come to be with them and heal Lazarus and everything would be fine. But that's not what Jesus did. In fact, Lazarus ends up dying. And I want to pick up the story in the Bible because there's something here I really want you to see with me. It says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. So he's been dead for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Oh, yes, Martha said, I I know he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Now, let me tell you what happens next. So everybody's distraught that Lazarus had died. And Jesus goes to the tomb. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And with those words, Lazarus rose from the dead after being dead for four days. Now, here's what I don't want us to miss about this story. You know, when Jesus said these words, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. He wasn't just saying those words to Martha. He was saying those words to her and to all of us as well. You see, the promise to live even after dying is a promise to every person who chooses to become a follower of Jesus. And this idea that we can have eternal life in heaven was not something new um, just to Martha and Mary here and to those that saw Lazarus rise from the dead. I mean, Jesus had been talking about if you believe in him, there's eternal life for you. He's been talking about that other places. In fact, one of the scriptures that many of you are familiar with, probably some of you even know it by heart, is in John chapter 3, verse 16. And notice what it says here. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus talked a lot about this. Now, I've been a pastor for more than 35 years. And I'll tell you one of the things that I've learned over those years. Most people are scared of death. It really messes with them. And I would add, this is also true of many Christians. And I just want you to know, here's the good news about death. You know, because all of us are going to have to go through this unless Jesus comes back and takes us before this happens. You do not have to be afraid of death if you are a follower of Jesus. In fact, here's what the Bible would suggest. You actually ought to look forward to it. You actually ought to look forward to the day that you're going to die and go to heaven and be in the presence of Jesus and the presence of every other follower of Christ who has gone before you. That is something you should look forward to. I hear all the time, you know, people talk about death as low. It's the worst day ever. If you're a Christian, it is not the worst day ever. It is the best day ever for you. It's the day when all things are made new. It's the day that you are ultimately healed. It's the day that you will begin your eternal life in a place where there are no problems, no sin, nothing bad. Never again is there sickness. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And the reason today that you can know that you're going to heaven is because Jesus has conquered death. And he proved it in his own resurrection and with what he did with Lazarus. Now, as a pastor, though, I know that a lot of people struggle with this. And when I try to dig into this with them, I usually hear people say, well, I'm kind of scared about it because I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. And here's the other thing that people most often say. The reason I'm worried about it is because I'm not quite sure that I'm good enough. And when I hear those words, you know, I understand why people would be a little scared of death. Because the truth is that if you tie your eternal life into being good enough, in the back of your mind, because you all know that you do wrong stuff, just like I do, you're always going to be wondering, well, how good is good enough? I want to take you back again to what Jesus said to Martha. Remember these words. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Can I ask you a question? In those words, do you see anything where Jesus talked about being good? No. Not a single thing. In John 3, 16, did Jesus say that the path to eternal life was about being good? No. It wasn't. Never brought it up. Why? Because it is not the path to eternal life in heaven. What is? 
is found in those who believe in Jesus and live for him. That's what Jesus said. If you believe in me and live in me, even though you might die, you're not going to die. You're going to be passed on to the next life, to your eternal life in heaven. Now, we live at a time when there's a lot of questions. So what does it really mean to believe in Jesus? What does it mean to live for him? Well, if I can just be this direct about it, basically it is you have to become a Christian. You have to become a Christian. And there is so much confusion about this today and misunderstanding about it. You know, people just think, well, being a Christian is I, I need to believe in God. I need to pray to him some. I need to go to church every now and then. Maybe give him a little money every now and then to the church and to things that are important to God. So we, we tie this kind of stuff into this. But that is not what the Bible teaches us about how a person becomes a Christian. Becoming a Christian, as you study the Bible, really involves three things. One of the things is that it involves believing in Jesus. In other words, believing that he came to the earth, that he didn't sin while he walked on the earth, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, that he's coming back again one day. And that you believe that in the Bible, everything that is said about Jesus is true and everything that Jesus said applies to your life. That is what it means to be a Christian, to believe in Jesus. And I would say that sometimes, you know, we look at it and say, well, I mean, I don't know if I can really say I believe in Jesus because I still have some doubts. I, I still have some questions. Well, you still can choose to believe in things even though you have some doubts. We do it all the time with stuff. So I would say to you, a part of becoming a Christian is believing in Jesus. Here's another part, that you confess your sins to him and that you repent. Now, what, what I mean by that is that in the Bible it talks about how confessing sins is a part of this, where we acknowledge that I'm a sinful person and I've done wrong in my life and I need to be forgiven of those so that I can be right with God. The repentance thing is that it isn't just enough to say, hey, Jesus, sorry about all those sins and acknowledge, you know, I, I've done bad things. It is that you genuinely have remorse about those things. And that you say, you know what, I am sorry that I've done them and I, I really will work hard with your help to not keep doing them. So it's a confession of sin. And Jesus says to us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So it's believing in him, it's confessing our sins. And here's the other thing, and this is big. We got to get this. It involves surrendering your life to Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he talked about we need to die to self. What was he saying there? Die to self. In fact, he said die to self daily. Well, dying to self is this idea that instead of you living your life to do whatever feels good, whatever feels right to you, whatever you think you should do, when you surrender your life to Jesus, it is saying to him, Jesus, instead of me being the leader of my own life, I'm going to make you the leader of my life. I'm going to start learning what you want from me and I will surrender to your will instead of doing my will. I will do what you want me to do instead of just what I want to do or what I think is right. So becoming a Christian involves those three things. Believing in Jesus, confessing sins, and surrendering your life to him. And in order for that to happen, it requires a choice from us. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, I, I've always been a Christian. I've always believed. And I want to be very pointed about this with you. You have not always been a Christian. You haven't. It doesn't work that way. At some point, you have to make a choice to become a Christian. I mentioned this here a few weeks ago at church, and I just want to say it again. So, you know, I know some of you weren't here a few weeks ago when I said this, and I, I just want to kind of give you an illustration about this. Many of you who are married, or if you're not, you certainly understand about marriage. You know, you can know someone your whole life. You might have known each other from the day you were kids. And you might have grown up together. And along the way, you might have gone out on a few dates. And you might have fallen in love with each other. But the fact that all of those things happen, that's not what made you married. In order for you to be married, there had to be a choice where one day you went before a judge or the pastor of a church and you stood there and you made promises to one another about the desire of your heart and the promises of commitment to one another. 
And it was on that day you heard the judge or the pastor say, by the authority committed unto me, as a, in my case, a minister of the church of Jesus Christ, I declare you husband and wife. And on that day, you became married. On that day, it was a choice. It's like that for being a Christian. It's a choice for me. I was a kid, probably 10 or 11 years old. My grandma died. And I knew from going to Sunday school that, you know, um, if I wanted to go to heaven to see my grandma again, because she was a Christian, that I was going to have to become a Christian. And I remember on my bed, in my bedroom, you know, and I was a kid, so I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have it all figured out yet. But I told Jesus, Jesus, I want you to come into my life and I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I want to go to heaven and I'm going to start living my life for you because I want to see my grandma again. That was my motivation then. It was a choice. And if you have never made that choice, I hope that you'll consider doing it today because Jesus' resurrection offers to all of us eternal life. You do not need to fear death and you can know without a doubt where you will spend your eternal life if you are a Christian. That is the key to that. One last thing. And that is believing in Jesus makes it possible for us to experience a fulfilling and satisfying life on this earth. I want to take you back again to that scripture where Jesus talked about how I am the resurrection and the life. So the resurrection, we've talked a lot about that today. But this whole thing about the life, what was that about when Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and I am the life? Well, we get a little more understanding about this at another place in the Bible, in John chapter 10. Now, let me just explain a little bit what's going on here. So in John chapter 10, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's helping people to understand the relationship in their mind uh, of how he wants to have a relationship with us by equating it with how a shepherd takes care of his sheep. You know, for us, a lot of us aren't familiar with shepherds and sheep. But in that day, everybody knew about shepherds and sheep. And so Jesus is painting this picture. He says, I'm like a good shepherd and all of you are like the sheep. And in the same way that a shepherd cares for his sheep, Jesus says, that's what I do for you. That's what I want to do for you. So the first 10 verses of John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about all this. You can look at it on your own later. We get to verse 10 and notice something that Jesus says here. I want you to see this with me. He said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So in those days, you know, there were people that come and take the sheep, you know, steal sheep. So that was certainly a part of what he's suggesting here, but it had a spiritual uh, understanding as well because the devil tries to pull us away from Jesus, tries to keep us from following him. So that's that reference to a thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But notice what Jesus said here. My purpose, Jesus says, is to give a rich and satisfying life. Huh. Now rich here isn't about money. It's about the quality of life. Jesus is saying that if you want to experience the best life possible in this earth, it is found in a relationship with Jesus and following the teachings and the Bible. I don't know if you've ever thought of Jesus this way or not, but Jesus is a life giver. He is. He is a giver of eternal life to those who follow him. And he's a giver of the best life you can experience on this earth if you follow him. Again, let me be clear. I'm not here to suggest to you that if you follow Jesus, that you'll never have a problem again and everything will just be great and you know everything will be wonderful from this point forward if you become a Christian. That isn't true, not true at all. But I will tell you something, following Jesus and living for him and following his teachings and allowing the one who can do anything and is more powerful than anyone or anything, allowing him to control my life and be in my life really does change everything about how I experience life on this earth. 
It is the path to the best life possible, the best kind of relationships possible, the best way to get our life free from some of the worry and stresses that we experience. It provides a different kind of life and a good way. And the reason we know Jesus is a life giver, not just of eternal life, but of the best life on this earth is because Jesus died and rose from the dead. That's what we're here to celebrate today. And I trust today that you have that kind of life that Jesus offers. We need to end. On this Easter Sunday, I hope you've chosen, chosen rather to believe in Jesus. And the reason that you can and should believe in him is because when he rose from the dead, he proved he was God that he proved that he is more powerful than anyone or anything, that he proved that you can always take him at his word, that he offers to you a reason why you don't have to fear death and you can know for sure where you're gonna spend your eternal life. I hope you've chosen to believe in him because he offers to you the best life possible on this earth. And if you have never made that choice to become a Christian that we talked about early in the service, I wanna tell you that's where you gotta begin. It'll be the most important decision that you will ever make. When we end today, we'll have some people here at the front and they would certainly welcome a conversation with you about that if you'd like to talk to someone or have someone pray with you about how to become a Christian. But you can just do it on your own. You don't need us to do this with you. You can go home today and you can say, Jesus, I want that in my life. I choose to believe in you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to surrender my life to you and start living the best I can for you from this day forward. If you will do that, it will change your life forever. Jesus died and rose from the dead in hopes that you would make that kind of choice. And I know that many of you are already followers of Jesus. And I hope today you make this a big day of celebration. Because Jesus' resurrection from the dead, it changed everything. In fact, there's this verse, a couple verses in 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to see this with me as we wrap this up. Think of this. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. Just think of that. If Jesus had just died and been put in a tomb and stayed there and not risen from the dead, you wouldn't be here today. And everything else that you believe about Jesus and God would be totally useless. And it says it would be useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope is in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything. And if you are a Christian, it is central to your faith and it is central to everything else that you believe about Jesus. So this day, let's celebrate the most consequential thing that Jesus Christ has done for us. He didn't stay in the tomb. Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for dying on that cross. And thank you when they put you in that tomb that you kept your word. You had said you would rise from the dead on the third day and you did just that. And Jesus, because you're alive, we experience so much in our life. And we thank you for all of it today on this Resurrection Sunday. Jesus, thank you for the miracle of new life and for the hope of eternal life. I pray that if there's any in this room or watching online right now that have never made that choice to become one of your followers, Jesus, that today would be the day that you in your own unique and powerful and special way would just continue to help them to work it all out in their mind and in their heart in these next hours ahead and that you would reassure them when they make that choice that you God you accept them and you forgive them from all their sins and that you offer to them this new miraculous incredible life 
Jesus, for those of us that follow you, today we want you to know how much we love you and we honor you and we celebrate the fact that you are our risen Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we end today? offers to you. Dwight died. Dwight didn't stay in the tomb. 
to offer to you this life-giving, eternal life in heaven and this life-giving experience of the rich and satisfying life on this earth. If you'd like someone to pray with you today, if you would like to talk to someone about how to take that step to become a follower of Jesus, just come here to the front as we end and uh, we would welcome that opportunity. I hope you have a great day celebrating the fact that Jesus is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you, everybody. Have a great Easter. You're dismissed.